Welcome to another episode of DD on the Spot. As always, I'm your host, Ryan Johnson. And before we get into our guest here today, I'd like to remind everyone that if you enjoy this content, to please give a like and subscribe down below. I greatly appreciate it. We have Jamie on the podcast. She's coming to us all the way from California, where she's just here to taunt me, basically, about the weather. That's, you know, something that I've accepted is going to probably happen here. So, you know, I'm just preparing myself mentally for it. But yeah, she's a physique competitor who has IFBB Pro. And yeah, just on here to share her journey, discuss all things health and fitness. But most importantly, she's our current guest. Jamie, thank you so much for coming on. Hey, Ryan. Thanks so much for having me. I really appreciate it. And um, yes, I'm not going to brag too much, but the weather is pretty fabulous here in Southern California. It's an abnormally warm winter here, so it's not too bad. I mean, we are in the mid-30s just for today, but I don't know how long that's going to last here. But yeah, we got it out of the way already, everyone. So, you know, hey, I was preparing myself for it. But before we just delve deep into that and I just become super depressed and never want to do a podcast ever again, Jamie, to get things started, why don't you just give us your backstory and what inspired and motivated you to get in shape and how that led to where you're at right now? I would love to. Um, you know, I always tell people that, you know, I didn't go looking for fitness. It was something that really found me. Um, it really took me to a place where I got to like what I would consider the lowest point in my life to really welcome it with open arms and just wholeheartedly dive into it there. There's not something specifically that I can attribute to the inspiration behind my drive to get into fitness. Like there was no specific person, there was no specific event that took place, but I got to a really low spot. Um, I had been in school my entire life. I went to college, graduated with my undergrad, um, went off and did an international internship in Melbourne, Australia for a summer. Um, and in my mind, that just sparked my ego and my confidence. And I was like, oh, I'm moving back to Los Angeles, like with a PR degree, with this amazing experience under my belt. I'm going to nab any job I want, no problem. I've got this. And lo and behold, when I returned, um, that was not the case. I actually ended up not even snagging a single interview for a single job, uh, for a big girl job, if you will. Um, I ended up right back at the same bartending job that I was at in college. And at that point in my life, all I had known was school and I had done well in school. And like in school, they don't groom you for the real world and the expectations that are, you know, you have to achieve. And um, so I was like, well, is this it? Like, is this what my life is going to amount to? So I just really felt like there was no control in that aspect of my life moving forward. And so I was living in Los Angeles. You know, I was just trying to scrape by. I was living with my best friend. We were partying every weekend as young single girls in their 20s do with all this freedom. And at that point, I was like, okay, well, what can I take control over in my life? And so that's where my best friend roommate at the time convinced me to join on to her 24 hour fitness gym membership and me being in the financial position I was in, I couldn't necessarily afford a gym membership. Like $40 extra a month was a lot to be expending. And so I told myself, I was like, you know what, this is supposed to be the prime of your life. You're going to look back on these years, X amount of years in the future. And do you want to look back and think like, wow, I could have done so much better. I could have felt and looked so much better. Or do you want to look back and be really proud of what you had? And again, I couldn't afford this gym membership, right? So I was like, well, if I'm going to pay this, I'm going to make it worth my while. I'm going to show up every damn day. I may not know what I'm doing, but I'm going to figure it out and I'm going to get somewhere with it. And so that's exactly what I did. So that lack of control professionally that I felt I had going for my future, I introduced fitness into my life. And it was the first time where I really, in tandem, also tried to get control of my nutrition, right? So I wasn't eating out as much. I had no idea how to meal prep. I was like, I think I need something that's protein. I think I need something green in there. And then like, I never knew how to measure anything either, which is wild to me now. <laughs> but uh, so that's what I did. And so like the first three months, I really just winged it. And you know what? I felt great. And I was like, I was motivated more than ever. I was starting to feel results first. And then I started to see results, which is the really exciting part. And at that point, I was like, okay, you know what? Like, I think I'm on a good track here. I mean, again, I have no idea what I'm doing. But at this point, I feel like I should hire someone who knows what they're doing, right? And so at that point, I was like, well, I'm a very, I'm a very goal oriented person. So it was like, okay, I'm feeling good. But like, what's the next achievable goal here? And so that's where I got the inkling in my mind. I was like, well, what about competing? Like, you know, why not? Why not? Like, we can get somewhere with this, maybe. And at that time, it was more so just 
it was just a goal for me. I was like, okay, you know, we can check this off the list. I remember always being on Instagram and just seeing girls who would compete way before I even lifted up a dumbbell. And I just remember like, they just, they looked fabulous for one, like amazing. And they looked so happy. And at that point in my life, I didn't have that happiness kind of going for me. So I was like, I envy that. And I want to experience that. I want to feel that level of happiness because here I am at this low, like, what does that high feel like, you know? And so that was my goal. I enlisted the help of my very first coach. Um, he was actually someone I went to high school with and we reconnected over Instagram and he was an IFBB pro. I had no idea what IFBB was at this time either. Side note. And I was like, well, pro isn't his name. He must know what he's doing. We got together he took me on my first prep for my first show. And my very first show was not with NPC. I actually competed with a federation called WBFF to start. Um, and my start was like, I was Googling bodybuilding. I was like, what do you do? And so I came across WBFF because I saw their big angel wings. And I saw, you know, the glamour of it all. And I was like, I want to do that. Um, so he got me ready for my first WBFF show. And we spent probably the greater half of six months preparing me for that show at the latter part of that same year I started. And um, I competed in, it's funny to me now, but I competed in bikini <laughs> and I also competed in their fitness division. And I remember I ended up placing top 10 in bikini and I was like, okay, that felt good. And then fitness came around and I ended up getting first place in fitness. And I was like, okay, you know what? Like I'm big into the universe. Like I feel like this is a sign. And I just, I caught that high that I so badly envied seeing on Instagram in the past. And I was like, from there I was hooked. I was bit by the competition bug. And I was like, all right, from here we got first place. I want a pro card next. Like that's my next goal. And so a year later I got with my coach that I am now with currently, and he got me ready. We flew to Atlanta for a show because this is in the midst of COVID in 2020. Did our first show together, Atlanta again, and um, I got my pro card in WBFF. And then from there, I took a year off, had a true off season, grew some more, came in with like the gnarliest package I had to date. That following year, I made a pro debut. Pro debut didn't go as we wanted. Um, and so at that point, my coach and I decided it's time to make the switch to MPC. I did my first MPC show in March of 2022. Um, I ended up getting the figure overall in that show. And then took another year off, grew some more, got stronger, came back, started doing women's physique, got qualified for nationals in 2023, uh, competed this previous year at uh, USA's in 2023. And I ended up getting my pro card this year. And that's where I'm at. That's pretty much been my journey leading up to this point, And it's been one hell of a ride. <laughs> yeah, that is definitely quite the journey. I mean, just going, moving from federations, moving through classes. What was it like to see your body progress through all that? Because I mean, like you went WBFF, you were, you know, physique there, and then you came back here and you had to go figure and then you had to go to physique. What was it that like to seeing your body progress yeah. year after year? Yeah, no, honestly, it was, it was amazing. And, you know, I have so much respect for the human body and like, I genuinely love bodybuilding. I love prepping. I love the offseason. I love all of it because it's like, it's such an intrinsic experience too. It's like you get to understand your own mind and your own body on such an intimate level that is just so special. Um, and just seeing that transform, you know, it's hard because it's like when you're actively prepping for a show, you know, you're checking in, you're looking at yourself, you're working out, like you're surrounded by all these mirrors and you're like, damn, like, but this, this skin right here, like this is fat. And then it's like, someone doesn't see you for a week. And then that next week they see you as you're actively prepping. And they're like, holy Toledo, like you look nutty. And so it's kind of like, it's so intimate, but it's also like an outer body experience too. Cause like, I feel like you don't really realize like how much you're transforming. And like, you know, I'm a big advocate for the, you know, the tried and true off seasons too, because it's like, there's nothing that can cheat that time. Time is such an important element to what we do in this sport as well. And it's like, shows are always going to be there. And it's like, you really need to take that time, like depending what your goal is, like, you know, if you want to build, you got to have that element of time there. And like, for me, that's been a huge thing. You know, I, if you would have asked me four years ago when I was doing that WBFF show in bikini, Hello. That tells you how small I was to start. Okay. Like I was competing in bikini, but if you would have told me then that four years later, I'd be turning pro with the IFBB and women's physique, I would have been like, 
Like, where did you get your drugs from? Like, what are you snorting? <laughs> like, well, I mean, speaking on that change as well, when you were first getting started, what was one body part that like really took off you? And what was one body part that dragged behind? And has that changed as you've gotten bigger and bigger and, and more better classes? Yeah, yeah. And I'm laughing because it's like, for me, like, I'm, I definitely have like a really great genetic predisposition to put on muscle. And I am so grateful for that. So shout out mom and dad. But um, one thing for me that was super lacking, like my weakest points were my back and my glutes and my hamstrings. And um, that was so hard for me to come up with. And my back over the last few years has just totally transformed totally transformed. And, you know, I really got to hand that off to my coach because he and I have hounded back at least once a week together in tandem for like the last two, almost three years. Um, and like when it comes to the posing too, like a front relaxed, it, like it did not compute up here how to talk to my lats. Like I could not open my lats to save my life. Um, but now as you know, my body has evolutionized to where it is now. It's like, I love training back is one of my most favorite things because I can very easily connect with those muscles and I can feel and I can overload and understand again, that more like intimate connection with my body there. Um, but as far as like what developed quickest on me, you know, again, having the genetic predisposition, I do my shoulders were the first thing that ever came in for me. It was like when I first started working out, I remember I have a selfie on my phone where I got so excited in this 24 hour fitness. Cause like the lighting hit just right. And I was like, that's a deltoid right there. Like, <laughs> saw the essence of a cap. And I was like, that's awesome. Um, but otherwise, yeah, my, my uh, glutes and hamstrings and my back have definitely been the weakest point. It's super cool to look back at like the very first check-in photos and just see how crazy like the wingspan especially has gone over time here. Do you think that starting in bikini and slowly working your way up helped you overall in posing? Because I know every, fe- I mean, every division is different posing wise, but do you think just having that background knowledge has helped even with physique posing, even though it's completely different from figure and bikini? You know, I don't think it's so much like having done bikini in the very first part of it. Um, I attribute my posing a lot to my theater background because I grew up doing theater and I did theater in college as well. So it was like, you know, that kind of transcended into the bodybuilding stage as well. Like I was very accustomed to being in a production and having an audience and having to emulate that stage presence. Right. So for me, it's like that theater brain, when I'm on that bodybuilding stage, it clicks on automatically. And it's like, all right, as soon as I'm on there, showtime, like no matter what the posing is, no matter what the routine, the division is, it's like, I can get there. And very fortunate for that. I don't have to imagine anyone in their underwear or anything like that, but I am definitely in my element when I'm on stage there. Well, when it comes to posing, what has your experience been like with it? Cause I, when I first started this, I was so dumb to the point of like, it's one of the hardest thing for so many competitors. It is, it is. And honestly, I really don't like posing practice. I do not like it. <laughs> it, Honestly, posing, it, it takes just as much work as anything else that we do here, whether it's our training or our diet or our cardio, like it takes just as much energy. And like, if you're a competitor who is not practicing their posing just as much as all those other elements, like that's going to show on stage. Like if you just pull something out of your back pocket real quick, it's going to be painfully obvious. So like posing practice is hugely important. It is so essential to what you bring ultimately to the stage and it deserves the time, but man, it is, it is a bitch. It is. <laughs> what was your friend and family's reaction? Like when you first announced that you're going to try bodybuilding and what's it been like as they've seen you evolve and, you know, get bigger and bigger. Yeah, no, that's a great question. That's a great question. Um, yeah. Cause I feel like, especially being a woman, right. Is, um, you know, I come from a very traditional family. Um, so they're like, my mom's big thing is like, okay, but just stay pretty, you know, is like, but how much bigger do you want to get? So, you, you know, at first it was like, oh yeah, like, you know, go you, you know, we're behind you. I was still, you know, I was fit. I wasn't huge back then. Um, but you know, it, it, it's more so like, there's definitely like a concern element around it, especially from my family side, you know, cause it's like, they're not used to, I'm the only member of my family who 
does bodybuilding or anything like that. I'm the most active there. Uh, but I do have to hand it off to my mom because my mom is supremely supportive of what I do. And she is my number one fan. Um, you know, she's been to all of my shows, you know, regardless of travel, like she'll, she's always there. Um, and you know, it just makes her happy seeing that, what I'm doing is truly what I'm passionate about. And, um, you know, ultimately like what I dream about and I feel like I'm not a parent myself, but I feel like for any parent, you know, that's what they want for their children is, you know, they want them to go out there and achieve their dreams and they, they want them to find their passion. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm very fortunate that my mother is definitely in my back corner when it comes to it. I mean, she has her, she has her moments where she's like, oh, okay, again, just stay pretty. And I'm like, all right, you don't have to worry about that. But like, I am going to get bigger. <laughs> well, I mean, you've won your pro card twice. Was it a different feeling for both of those times? Or was it sort of the same? And uh, well, honestly, like, what was that moment like both times when they announced your name? And you realize, oh, my God, I'm a pro now. Yeah, yeah, no, that's uh, another great question. Because, you know, it was different, if I'm being honest, um, because not a lot of people I feel like are familiar with WBFF. They probably heard of it to some extent, but nowhere is near as IFBB, right? Like, so I give the analogy like this, like think of WBFF in comparison to IFBB, you know, IFBB is MLB professional baseball, right? And then WBFF is AAA baseball, right? Still great athletes, still caliber of a sport. However, you know, definitely the IFBB is going to hold more weight over the WBFF at the end of the day. And again, when I was competing with WBFF, I was very novice in the sport. And, you know, to just even receive my pro card at that point, you know, it was like overwhelming. Like, you know, I feel like for me, especially from where I came to and what drove me to that point to begin with in my life was like, wow, I really achieved something here. Like I'm being recognized. Like, you know, I, I this is what I meant to do, essentially. Um, now, when I got my IFBB pro card like that just was 10 times over, you know, because that is, that's it. That's bodybuilding. That's bodybuilding. No one can tell me otherwise, you know? So again, it was that validation and, you know, it was that recognition. And my whole thing was, was the reason I transitioned from WBFF to the NPC IFBB world is that, you know, I wanted that recognition of being the athlete that I am. You know, I wanted to be celebrated in a sport that appreciates the athleticism behind it and sees their people as not like a prop, but an athlete and be recognized for that. And so the IFBB, like that was, I remember, um, right when I got off stage, like I was jumping up and down and my coach like sidelines me, um, backstage. I didn't even see him coming And Like, this is a big man. Like I didn't even see him coming, but he just envelops me in this giant hug and we're just hugging it out. And I'm just like, man, we did it. We did it. And then I feel him like start to shake a little bit. And I realize he's crying and I'm like, Oh my gosh, like we really just did that. And it honestly, it took some time for the feeling to settle in for me that I was an IFBB pro, um, maybe like a little bit of shock, a little bit of disbelief. I don't know. Um, but I mean, that was, I can't even really express the words for that feeling because I don't know if they exist. It felt that good. How did you make that change and how did you change your body so much? in just that little span of a year from going to competing in figure to all of a sudden you're a physique pro like that rarely happens from people that I've talked to. <laughs> yeah. You know, um, Again, I feel like I really got to chalk it up to my coach on that one, too. You know, uh, he called it right after my WBFF pro debut, you know, uh, basically the feedback of that show, put it this way, like there were six girls in my category and I got fifth place out of six. And again, I brought like the craziest conditioning in my life. I was the only girl with glute to hamstring tie-ins on the stage. And I remember he and I sat up until 2 a.m. in our Atlantic City Airbnb. And he was telling me, over cookies, of course, he was telling me, you know, I really think we need to make this switch. He's like, in two years, I can see you going pro in women's physique. And again, like, I didn't really speak that language, but I was like, you know what? More than anything, I trust you. So if that's what you think, like, if you think that's going to be our goal, like, let's run it. Let's do it. And then fast forward, literally two years later, like we did that. So honestly, competing in figure initially with NPC, it was more so to kind of get my feet wet in the federation with NPC. You know, again, I came from a different world prior. Um, so the fact that we got the overall in figure in that first show, I was like, well, all right, again, confirmation, we're exactly where we're supposed to be. And we knew right after that show, again, we're going into the off season and again, chalking it up to him because. 
our training intensity was exactly where it needed to be. You know, um, my body was very respondent, um, when it came time to push the way we pushed. Um, and so again, I think it's in part to him in part to, you know, my genetic predisposition. And then also like, I'll give myself a pat on the back as an athlete, because whatever I was prescribed, I executed no questions asked, you know? And just, when you become a bodybuilder, you sort of sign a deal with the devil where it's, you're never going to be big enough. You're never going to be good enough. The whole body dysmorphia thing. How do you deal with that? Yeah. Because that is just such a big struggle that a lot of people assume that once you become a bodybuilder, it's like, oh, you must like, you must absolutely love your body where it's like, sometimes the exact opposite happens. Oh, a hundred percent. Like you're singing to the choir on that one. It happens every day, every day. Like I literally just made a reel and posted it to Instagram because it's exactly like you said, like some days I wake up and I'll look at myself in the mirror and I'm like, damn girl, all those shoulders be shouldering today. And then other times it's like, did you get flatter overnight? Like, how did that even happen? It's just, it's an ongoing struggle. Like like you said, you're never going to be content with what you have. You're never going to be big enough. You're always going to be out there, especially on the internet and in the digital age that we're in comparing yourself to other people and other athletes out there. I mean, there's never going to be that contentment. Like, I don't even think Arnold Schwarzenegger looked in the mirror and said like, Hey, my guy, you are it. Like you are only it. Like that's not the case for anybody. Um, it's a tough thing to deal with, but it's also one of those things where it's like, Hey, you know what? Like, Trust the process, you know, just do exactly what you're supposed to do and just trust that if you're training under intensity, if you're eating the right things, if you're executing your cardio protocols, if you're doing absolutely everything in your control, like there is no reason why you shouldn't be progressing to where you want to be for your next goal here. No, absolutely. And just, yeah, people got to realize that, I mean, I've talked to people that have won the Olympia and they still, you know, pick out flaws in their body, even after a show what they, that they yeah. just won. So it's, it's, it's never going to stop no matter, you know, how good you get and you just got to roll with it. But just seeing, you know, as you've done so much in this sport, you've been competing for quite a while and this sport is always ever evolving. What have been some of the biggest things that you've seen personally change from when you first got started to now? Oh, first got started in terms of like where like the sport has kind of changed. Yeah. Like when you first started following the sport, even up oh. until now, cause like it's, I mean, even in the five and a half years that I've been doing this podcast, the sport is complete night and day from when it was when I first started. Oh, a hundred percent. And I literally say the exact same thing is that like this sport is always evolving. It's like the criteria is always changing. You know, they could be looking for one thing one year at the national level, and then that could totally change the next year, the next time. So I find too that, uh, you know, what I've noticed, I feel lately is that, um, well, some of these women are so big in the category, like, how are they not women's bodybuilding at this point, you know, and like, where does that line cross? Like, when do we decide, like, okay, some of these women's physique women should move over to bodybuilding. And then like, same thing with figure too. It's like, okay, but is that airing on women's physique? So like, sometimes I feel like the criteria gets blurred in that sense. And then also it's like, as far as like the conditioning level goes too, right? Like for USA's, I actually competed in both figure and women's physique. So for women's physique, I was in the end exactly what they were looking for. You know, my conditioning was on point. I was grainy. I had all the striations. Like I was hard AF, you know, and then competing in figure, same amount of women in my class, you know, seven girls, I got six out of seven, which tells me, you know, and then looking at who ultimately won, they had a much softer look, right? Which may not have been the case, like at that show two years ago, right? It could, just could have been what they were looking for at that time. So it's interesting. And, you know, I feel like that kind of as a bodybuilder in the sport, it kind of toys with your mind too, because how do we anticipate what they're looking for? Like, how do I bring what they want? Right? Like, it's hard to say. And I feel like that kind of plays with even more on like the body dysmorphia too. It's like, oh, man, like, am I going to be conditioned enough? Am I going to be too conditioned? <laughs> It is so much more of a mental sport than it is a physical sport. And so many people just do not understand that. But like, let's be completely honest too. You're not the average looking woman. If you were to walk out in public dressed the way you are right now, you are going to draw people's attention. I compare it to being like a mini celebrity where it's just human nature when they see something that's not of the normal to just sort of just be fascinated by it. What's that been like? And as you've done this more and more years, has it gotten easier to deal with that? Or are you still at the point where you're like, okay, this is still kind of weird? Yeah, no, that's, that's definitely part of, that comes with it that like no one really tells you about. Um, there's no guidebook on kind of how to like deal with that. Um, you know, it's, it's definitely gotten easier over the years. Um, I think at first, um, it was kind of like, whoa, like someone's looking at me or like, oh, someone's pointing at me, you know, 
Now I think I'm a lot more, you know, I, I want to say used to it in a sense. So it's like, I understand completely. Like I own mirrors. I know I don't look like the average woman, you know, and I just try and stay cognizant of like, like you said, you know, it's not something people see every day. Like it's human nature to be curious, to be fascinated by something like that. Um, and I even compared to like when I was prepping for USA's, like I was so conditioned and I live in, you know, the Palm Springs area. So summertime it gets very hot. So for example, I'd go grocery shopping in a crop top with like every single stomach vein just hanging out. Right. Cause there's no body fat. Literally people would be like breaking their necks to look at me. And, you know, in my head, I try not to get frustrated and be like, you know, what are you looking at? I'm just a person like mind your own business type thing. You know, like I feel kind of like invaded that way, but then also realizing like, okay, Jamie, take a step back because like, you also look like an alien right now. Like no one has, these people have probably never even seen a woman like with this much muscle and like this much vascularity just out in the open, like a freak show, you know? So I try not to get I don't want to say overwhelmed, I don't think is the right word for it, but I try not to get like, um, oh, what are you looking at? You know, because I feel like that's also my human nature, right? Is like, we don't like being stared at. Like, I'm not a museum exhibit. Like, you know, take a picture, it lasts longer, but tag me in it, you know? Uh, <laughs> but um, I think that's the hardest part is like kind of shutting those initial thoughts off of being like, you're invading my space. Like, you know, I'm just a person. Like, leave me alone. And just like, you know, who knows what they're thinking, right? It could be, and I can't read minds. So it could be like, oh my gosh, like that's disgusting. Like that girl looks crazy. Or it could be out of sheer admiration. Like, wow, that really is difficult to accomplish. Like kudos for her. And you know what? I feel like it's, that's the greater half of it is like the admiration that comes with it. And you know, I've definitely had people like stop me in the middle of a parking lot or something like that. And all they say is like, you know what, like looking at you, I can tell how much discipline that takes. And that's amazing. Like you are the epitome of health. And I don't think people realize either, like, you know, how much that makes my day, right? Like hearing that is just like, oh, you know, that's my goal. I, I, I want to impact people and I want to motivate people, um, you know, maybe not to bodybuild per se, but just to live your most quality, your most healthiest life that you can um, and just embrace it and allow it to change your life for the better um, as I feel it has mine. What would you say is the biggest misconception that you get as a bodybuilder from people in the general public? Because so many people are so misinformed about this sport and this lifestyle. Yeah, I feel like um, <laughs> I feel like the biggest misconception is that when it comes to competing, people think that as soon as your show is over, they're like, "Oh, so you get to eat everything now?" Like, no, no, no. Like that's not the case. Like, oh, so you don't have to do cardio now? No, also not the case. You know, just because the show has ended, like I'm on year round. This is my life. You know, I never clock out of this job. It's full time, 24 7, 365. Um, everything from diet, cardio, training is always controlled because I look at like the off season. I call that the prep before the prep. The moves you make in your off season are going to dictate the kind of prep that you have for your next show. So it's really up to you. Like, how difficult do you want to make it on yourself? Do you want to throw caution to the wind and just dive right in like people? typically misconceived that you're doing um, and have a really hard time when you decide to do this again? Or do you want to make your life a little less miserable when it comes to the on season preparing for a show and just stay on top of it? Um, and that's the thing too, like, you know, people are like, the biggest thing I think is the diet is the misconception is like, oh, so you're eating 5000 calories. So you're eating bonbons all day, aren't you? No, when the, the reality is, is that year round, again, I'm eating the same exact foods I'd be eating on prep. I'm just eating a different quantity of those. You know, I'm eating a greater portion of those same foods, basically. Yeah, it's the nutrition side. I mean, we could have a whole 10 hour podcast on that because that is just oh, so yeah. much into it. And it's just that was the one thing that shocked me, obviously, the most when I really, you know, got into this. But just seeing how social media has changed bodybuilding, especially so much with everything what are your thoughts on that? Because I know yeah. some people are kind of like annoyed that it, it does look like sometimes people just compete just for the clout sometimes. And I know there are people like that. And a lot of people like the traditionalists will be like, oh, that's that's bad for the sport. Like you should just want to do it because you want to do it. But where do you fall on the whole, you know, social media thing on bodybuilding? Because it has been a revolution really with the whole sport with social media. 
Oh yeah, it's huge. I feel like it's an integral part at this point to the sport. You know, everybody's on it. Um, you know, I feel like social media has really only enhanced the community around the sport. I feel like it's also granted this exposure to the sport that maybe wouldn't have been there otherwise. Well, I, you know, I revoked that because it wouldn't have been there otherwise. You know, um, I feel like it's kind of a double-edged sword. So that's like the positive side of it. But then there's also like the negative side of it too, where it's like, well, what kind of exposure are you giving to it? Like what kind of things are you putting out there? And then, you know, there are these specific people who, like you said, are just doing it for the clout and, you know, are they, are they trying to, you know, uh, promote themselves and give misinformation on the internet and just generate, monetize it, you know, and just glorify it in a way where they're giving misinformation to people and pumping a large audience, just misinformation and just clouding their heads. Like, I, I feel like you have to be able to weed through it here. Um, I think there's a lot of great things that come from it. I've met so many great people over like Instagram, for example, um, and connected with a great community of people, like-minded people in the sport. Um, and we've maintained great friendships, uh, you know, over Instagram. And, you know, there's a lot of support that comes with that too. Cause I mean, it's such a great tool to use, you know, when you are, for example, prepping especially and you're documenting your whole prep right and you've got this whole community behind you you know you've got friends you've got fans you've got whoever you know really in your corner and sometimes like when you're crying alone in your car like over your dry tilapia like maybe that might be the encouragement you need you know um and I think it's also great too like I mean there is business ventures to be had with it as well um you know I um want to say like some people like I feel like may not do it for the right reasons but I feel like there are still like honest and true people out there who like genuinely want to do well and, um, you know, give the sport the right kind of exposure that it needs. I feel like, you know, bodybuilding is a definitely under-recognized sport, even still with social media. Like it's not football, it's not baseball, but, you know, <laughs> there, there's a reason why not a lot of people do it. Like, I feel like it needs to be celebrated even more, but I might be a little biased. Oh, absolutely. Me too. And I mean, obviously there are other people who think so little about the sport when it just comes to the fact that they don't realize the dedication that requires them, they get into it. And then they realize, you know, two weeks in they're like, yeah, this is way too hardcore for me. Like I am not that dedicated of a person, but speaking on that dedication, I mean, we mentioned before we started recording how, you know, you can have a very limited social life when it comes to this sport because it demands so much from you. How do you try to somewhat balance a social life? Because I have failed completely. And, you know, if you've even done 1% better than me, I want to know how and what you're doing. <laughs> you know what, Ryan? I wish that I could say I've done better, but I don't really know what a social life is, if I'm being honest. You know, um, I mean, for me, I, I'm just thinking back to my most recent prep experience for USA's. And um, to be quite frank, you know, about the six week out point, I pretty much isolated myself entirely um, because I really had to get to that mental space that I had never ventured to as an athlete before. Um, and for me, it was just about waking up every single day and just making sure I cross my boxes every day, you know, wake up do your training, get your meals, do your cardio, be there for your people. Yeah, I'm a personal trainer by profession, you know, so like I still have to work. Like I like to keep my lights on and everything. So it's like I didn't have time. I did not have the mental capacity. I remember at that point I told my mom, I was like, um, hey, you know what? Like if anything happens in life, if someone buys a new house, if someone has a baby, if someone dies, I don't want to know about it until August 1st, until after this show, because I cannot compound any more stress onto my mental than is already there. Like I did not respond to friends on text messages for weeks. I was part of group chats. I was just completely ghost from and I remember like one of my girlfriends texted like, Hey, Earth to Jamie, like, are you still alive? And I remember texting her back and I'm like, Hey, you know what? Like I'm here. I'm good. I'm just going through the motions, but respectfully, like I just need to pull away right now. And you know, it's nothing personal, but my goals are, so this is what I need to do for myself. So there was definitely no like, Oh, let's go to the beach. Let's go to six flags. Let's go do this. Let's do that. I didn't want to do anything. If it didn't have to do with my prep, I was not interested in it. I think the most social aspect I had over those few months was, you know, again, being a personal trainer, being in my gym, because that's where I work. That's where I work out. And then working out with my coach at his gym being around my teammates that were there and they can even tell you firsthand when they saw me during that time. Like I'm a very like uppity extroverted person. Like I'm usually super happy. Oh, I went in there with the longest face possible and people would come up to me like, Hey, 
And I'm like, I'm just happy to be here. <laughs> That's it. That's all I got. No social battery whatsoever. Absolutely. And being that you are a personal trainer, we are at that very end of January here where some of the New Year's resolutioners have you know, started to fade out a little bit. But being that you work in the field, what is probably some of the biggest mistakes or stuff that people struggle with the most when they really do try to get started in a healthy and fit life? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, because, you know, I'm, I'm very fortunate. I, I work with all different types of walks of life. Um, you know, I, primarily lifestyle. That's my forte there. I do have a couple of clients who have expressed interest in potentially competing in the future. So we'll see where that goes. But I think one of the things that I run into the most, because I like to think of myself as like, I'm very honest. So I'm not going to fluff you up. I'm not going to gas you up and be like, oh yeah, like in three months, if you keep this booty band around your knees, I'm going to get you exactly where you need to be in 90 days. Like, no, I'm going to give it to you straight up. Like I'm not going to, I'm not going to be yes here. And so I think the biggest thing too, is like, it's that idea of time for people that we were talking about earlier. So it's like, especially people who are outside of this world of just health and fitness in general, again, just taking bodybuilding out of it here. Um, they're like, you know, Oh, I've been at it for three months now. Why am I not seeing results? You know, or like, Oh, if I do 25 sessions with you, like, will I see this? And I'm like, you know what? I can't answer that with a yes or no, right? Like I can only provide for you what we're doing here in the gym. I can give you a cardio regimen. I can give you, you know, diet. I can give you this X, Y, Z, but at the end of the day, it's going to be up to you and your execution. You know, what is your sleep like? What is your diet like cardio? There are so many other factors that compound onto one another here. And I don't think that's what people understand when it comes to just getting in the gym. They think just getting in the gym is going to be the solve all the end all be all to get them where they want to be. But they need to take the responsibility and the accountability to perform all of those other actions in order to achieve the results they want to see. Absolutely. And I mean, if someone were to also walk up to you and say, Jamie, we made a decision. You can change one thing about the sport of bodybuilding and everyone would go along with it. We'll be one thing you'd like to see change. And honestly, you can do more than one. Oh, oh, oh my gosh. <laughs> if you were given the God power over the sport. <laughs> I was given the God power. Oh my gosh. Oh, you stumped me on that one. I'm just going to go with my knee jerk reaction um, to answer this question because it was the thing that was the most difficult for me. I would take away the front relaxed pose. Be done with it. <laughs> it is so what, hard. What about it, it was so what about it was your struggle? Was just the biggest struggle was just getting the lats out as far as they could. And just it's one thing when you look in the mirror and like you have that muscle memory, you can feel it. But when you're on stage and the mirror's gone, it's like, is my chest up high enough? Have I pushed out enough? I'm not really sure. I'm not seeing how this translates here. And for me, it was like getting the front relaxed was like, man, I practiced that thing months, months, like over and over again. And I would get so frustrated because I would try and open up and my coach would be like, nope, nope, reset, do it again. I'm like, damn it, dude. Like, what is this going to take? And then all of a sudden, literally one day I was practicing in front of the mirror and I was like, oh my God, I told my girlfriend, Kristen, I was like, Kristen, come here. I got it. But then after that, I Oh, it's just so hard because I feel like it's been such a struggle for me nailing that one pose that like if I could do away with it, like that, that would help me out so much. It's always that one pose for someone that just they just struggle with so much and it's the bane of their existence. I, I swear almost everyone has one. And what are your goals for 2024? Where would you like to be at, at, let's say, Christmas time next year or this year? Yeah, no. Yeah. I mean, again, I'm a goal oriented person here. Um, so this year is actually, I'm taking the entire year off, um, for the off season here. So I'm most looking forward to, um, getting stronger primarily. I don't want to say getting bigger that comes with getting stronger. I'm really looking forward to feeling the strength and getting stronger. Um, and so my goals, uh, attributed to that are like, you know, I want to train harder than ever. I want to break all my personal best this year by Christmas this this next year um and 
as much as it's the bane of my existence, I would love to just nail that front relax. My goal is to just get so confident with my posing that when it comes time for me to make the pro debut and step up there with the other women's physique pros that I'm not even nervous. I have the confidence. I know that I'm going to nail it no matter what. Um, another goal is to really perfect my routine. I'm going to bring the same routine that I did for USA's. It's going to be so polished and perfect by the time I step on the pro stage that I just want to be undeniable. I want to be undeniable because the goal from there is, you know, I want to win that pro show and I want to get qualified. So you'll see me at Olympia 2025. Absolutely. And what's one area of your physique that you hope to have improved on the most when we have you back on? So we can, we can double check this time and we'll see if you've actually <laughs> pulled it off. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it always comes back to my back always comes back to my back. I feel like in this division, you can never have enough back. Just do pull-ups every day. You'll be fine. <laughs> every day. I'm just going to do a set of pull-ups, flare the lats. Pull-ups, flare the lats. I know people that have the thing right right below their bedroom. They have the pull-up bar in their door, and they just do like 10 every time they walk past it. I have one. That was one of my COVID purchases. It's in my bathroom. Have I used it since COVID? No. <laughs> But I may need to. <laughs> I'm feeling inspired now. I think I'm I'm gonna go do a set of pull ups once we sign off today. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely Hey, it's again, I just don't be like me where it was I had one on my brother's door and it fell down when I was using it during COVID. It landed right on my oh, back. No. Luckily it was padded. It luckily it was carpet. It wasn't like steel concrete, but yeah. So make sure that you have oh, it on what? nice and and again, I am six three, two hundred and ten pounds, so it's you know, you gotta have it a little Damn. bit special for me. Yeah, I know. And that's the thing that I always love to whenever I like if I ever go to a local show here and I meet some of the guests in person, that's the first thing they say, because like you can't tell how tall I am just from talking to me here. But that's what I was going to say, dude, you are so tall, six, three. You're literally a foot taller than I am. That's what I find so funny about these shows when I go to them is that I could bounce most of these guests like a basketball. Like really, if oh. I wanted to, where I've taken some photos of them where my elbows are just like resting on the top of their heads like this. That's going to be like, me. Yeah. yeah. I, I mean, but hey, I find. I find it even more inspiring. Like when you see a shorter person that's just like so jacked and you're like, okay, that's just, but I do have a soft spot for the taller guests too. Like if you're six feet tall and you're just super jacked too, I'm just like, okay, yeah, that's, 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 you know, really, you know, impressive as well. But yeah. yeah. And lastly, before we wrap things up, I mean, you talked about coaching and what do you look for in a coach specifically that makes a coach good for you? Because like we talked about with social media where it's taken off and unfortunately a lot of bad coaches have come out of it as well. People that don't know what they're talking about that say, Hey, you know, buy my methods or buy my meal plans. And they give everyone the same meal plan. But when yeah. you're specifically, were looking for a coach, what things were you looking for to make your coach like a good coach? Cause it does differ from person to person, but in general, yeah. you know, a lot of people have some similar qualities that they're looking for in a coach. Oh yeah, no, it, totally. Um, you, you know, for me, because my coach I'm with now, he and I have been together, shoot, this year it'll be four years in September we've been working together. Um, you know, prior to that, I had two previous coaches. Um, my first coach was the one I enlisted the help on uh, for WBFF. Um, and then he and I parted ways after my very first show. Um, and then I got poached by another WBFF coach. And um, there was one thing that really stood out to me um, when it came to switching over to my coach that I'm with now. And there was kind of a, a layover, if you will, uh, during that time where I was getting ready to get my pro card in Atlanta for WBFF. I was with this WBFF coach and then I had just started training with him and I hadn't told the WBFF coach I was working with someone else because I had the intention of making him my trainer. But anyways, um, there was one time I remember same day and this was like the tell all sign for me was she essentially asked me to pay her way to be there at the show to support me as an athlete. And I wasn't her only athlete competing, no tea, no shade, but that didn't sit super well with me. Um, I didn't love that. And that very same day, my coach, he had just met me like two weeks prior. He took over my prep for Atlanta about five weeks out. And he contacted me that same day she did and said, hey, I'm thinking about coming out to Atlanta. You know, no questions asked, like to be there to support you. And that made up my mind. So it's like something like that where it's like, you know, someone prioritizes you, um, someone who genuinely wants to see you excel, who wants to be there to support you and wants to have you reach, you know, your capabilities of being the athlete that you can. Um, I think that's the biggest thing. And I think trust is another element too. Like I know that I can lean on my coach for just about anything. Um, and I think that's really huge. I think someone who isn't going to be paying attention to you, who's not going to make your success a priority as a reflection of themselves as a coach, um, who isn't going to give you that support, who isn't going to feel trustworthy, who you don't feel like you have that good coach to athlete relationship. Um, I feel like 
that's how you kind of debunk a good coach from a bad coach. And I am very fortunate to say that in my opinion, I, I do have the best coach. <laughs> I honestly could not have said it better myself. It's just, yeah, with a coach who, and yeah, having them care and just ask questions too is obviously something I always say too. Communication is sure. huge. Yeah. That's the biggest thing. Someone you can openly communicate with. If you feel like you have to hold back or you feel like trepidatious about saying something or asking something, that's probably not the right person you should be yeah. working with there. Oh, absolutely. I could not agree more. And again, everyone go and check out Jamie's Instagram page. I'll leave a link down below and buy everywhere. You will get inspired to get off that couch and stop eating all those damn Twinkies. But again, Jamie, thank you so much for coming on and sharing your story. It was an absolute delight to talk to you. Thank you so much, Ryan. Likewise. All right, everyone. This is Ryan Johnson, DD on the spot signing off. Have a great day, everyone.